good on that one. We're good on that one. All right. It's to totally weird doing this without Mike here. <laughs> no. He decided to quit my partner. Anyway, um, I guess we'll welcome to the uh, PCL podcast. It's untitled at this point because of changes. So I'm Logan, and uh, I got Lauren, Lauren here. Hi, I'm Lauren Robinson, the director of the Preble County District Library. And we got Carly to our right. Yes, I'm Carly Wall. I'm the branch librarian of the Eaton Library. And we're here with uh, James Willis. And well, we'll go ahead and introduce you guys. Hi, I'm James Willis. I'm the founder and director of the Ghost of Ohio. Yeah, I'm Samantha Nicholson. I'm a member of the Ghost of Ohio. I'm Wendy Swinsky. I'm a member also from the Cleveland area. And I'm Mark DeLong. I'm a member from the Dayton area. All right, and today we're just going to be chatting about well, ghosts, I guess. What do you guys do, and how do you guys get into this? And Carly, I know you got some questions. Yeah. So I if you want to start. Question. Have you guys ever investigated any other libraries, and what did you find? Yes, we have. Okay. And yes, we found stuff. <laughs> and I don't know if, well, is that kind of public? Knowledge now, now that you've done talk about it, it is, it is, yeah, okay. yeah. I think we've um, done talk about it. We did, we were just up north at the Greenville Library, okay, and we had everything from sound of people falling down to mysterious smells. Um, Jim's wife had her shirt tugged, and she will no longer come on investigations. <laughs> with <laughs> That's a story. Yeah. <laughs> she used to just wait in the car, but now she wouldn't even come to the investigation. <laughs> Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it just fascinated me because uh, part of what got me into this was Ghostbusters. So to have the opportunity to go into a haunted library is just something that I think we've all been aching to do for for years. So it's always fascinating to yeah. go in there. Yeah, it is interesting. Well, uh, what are you guys' favorite ghost hunting equipment? I don't know what the term is, but what's your favorite one that you use? Mine, believe it or not, I tend to use everything and then I feel kind of foolish because I spend more time fumbling around for the proper device. Mm -hmm. I kind of just like to, I'll bring a, an audio recorder with me and I'll set it down because then I can start it and just let it run. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes just like to sit and take it all in. So I, I will go back and forth, but I don't know if I actually have a favorite device. There is a, a Mel meter that I like to use just because it works as a temperature gauge as well as a, an EMF electromagnetic field detector so it does the work of two devices plus it lights up so I don't need a flashlight so you know I tend to go to that but a lot of times I'll just sit quietly and try to get almost in tune with the environment and what things kind of play out that way. Very cool. So like have that. you guys messed with uh, thermal imaging at all like the flare camera and yeah. stuff like that? We have yeah, yeah. something that um, I think makes the Ghost of Ohio somewhat unique other than we've been doing this for almost 20 years in Ohio which makes us I think paranormal grandparents. grandparents. <laughs> I could be the paranormal pappy, I guess. I'm okay with that. But um, is we will take a, we're always looking for the new equipment that's out there. And with the surge of these, uh, you know, ghost reality shows, they use a lot of different equipment that you're like, I don't even know how that, why would they use that? How does that work? So we will take equipment and test it. We try not to break it, but we will see if it actually does what it's supposed to do. And the, the thermal cameras are interesting because they do work the way they're supposed to, but um, you can also fool them a lot. So um, thermal imaging really doesn't understand things like windows a lot of times, or the famous thing, which I call it the, the ghost cat, is if a cat were to jump up on your bed and lay there for a few hours and then leave, that residual heat that that cat had, you know, especially mine who don't really ever move, they just lay there for hours and hours. When they get up, there'll be a shape of a cat on the bed that looks, if you're looking just through the thermal, that there is still a, you know, a ghostly cat there, but it's really just leftover heat from it. So, That's so cool. how long does the heat last? With my cats, probably about a week. I, yeah, I, I think it varies. Do you remember, it, Mark, how long when we did it about the handprint? It varies depending on the. Um, the surface that is being heated up, if it's a, um, if it's an insulator, it will stay for a long time. That is, like, if I put my hand on the wall and count to five and walk away, I'll see my handprint for probably a minute or two on a thermal flare camera on the wall. Or if I leaned up against it, I'll see a body imprint. 
I have a picture from when I was sitting in a chair for a while mm -hmm. at the library and I got up and walked around and I came back and took a picture of that chair with the FLIR camera and it looks like somebody had, was sitting there and it wow. was still heated up. So it can, it can last a while. So what Jim's saying is absolutely right. And you have to make sure you have, understand the control of the room where the camera is looking so that you don't have incidental things like that. You don't even think about it. You go and open the doorknob or you push on the door. Now there's a handprint on the door. <laughs> and it's. Yeah. <laughs> so. But it's still a useful, very useful device. Yeah, and another reason that we test things is because we, we tend to get really excited when something unexplained happens. And a lot of times in the past it used to happen because we weren't that familiar with the limitations of the equipment. So it was doing something that we were like, that's a ghost. It's clearly a ghost. And then. You get really depressed when you find out, no, it was just the equipment you know, malfunctioning or it was doing something you know, totally different. So we try to make sure we don't get excited for no apparent reason. It still happens, though. But. Yes, you're getting false positives and stuff yes. like that from your yeah. own errors. Oh, yeah. uh, so before we start this podcast, you were talking to us about our experience and stuff like that. What's your typical, without giving away too many trade secrets, your typical process for going to a hunt like this? It's a great question. What... Um, we like to do is we I think as a group are fascinated with that sort of connection between actual history and the ghost story and so we are always looking to find out if something did happen within history that could potentially lead to a haunting so we're looking for that in the the stories that always starts out we try to collect as many as we can but then we actually prefer the one-on-one -on -one interview that we do with people and the reason for that to be totally transparent, maybe pun intended, but I'm not sure. But um, we want to be able to hear the person tell the story because a lot of times, especially today with the internet and things like that, stories just take off. Anybody can write anything and it goes out and it suddenly becomes known as being a quote unquote fact. But when you sit down with someone and they tell you about their experience, you can look in their eyes, you can hear in their voice that even if it wasn't really a ghost, that person believed that. And that's what I think helps drive us to then look at, okay, well, this person really believes something happened in this particular area. That'll tell us we need to focus on that area. We'll also listen for some, you know, what they were doing at the time, you know, what time of day it was, because way back in the day, it was always funny, and we did this for years, and I, it was just because of me, I guess, but people would say, making this part up, but, you know, every day at 2 o'clock on a Tuesday, Two o'clock in the afternoon, we see a ghost walk by, and I would write all that down and go, okay, we'll be out Saturday night. Well, why? Go there when the people are experiencing it. So part of hearing those stories is so that we can focus on those areas and then try to repeat what they're doing. If people always are encountering things, for example, when they're closing up, we will literally go and pretend we're closing up, have the equipment running, and then leave. Because if that's when it's happening, let's see if we can replicate it. So that's usually... What we'll, where we'll start, we'll get the stories, we'll set up the equipment in those particular areas, and then it makes for very boring television, but we sit back and we watch. Um, we will, if there are certain, what people often refer to as trigger objects, in other words, people report um, dishes moving, or books moving, or you know, clothing moving. Or puppets. Or puppets, yes, <laughs> yes or puppets. Um, we'll bring those in, you know, bring them in and try to actually interact with the ghost because let's see if it works we don't i can't say this enough we don't yell and demand that ghosts do things i will admit that i watch those shows but i root for the ghost mm -hmm. you know when they're like why don't you do something i'm like get them really hard <laughs> really really hard you know but but we think that's just rude and if ghosts do exist and they are what people believe which is that they are the spirits or you know of people that once lived it's really kind of rude to show up in their quote unquote house and boss them around. Because if you think, if we were just sitting here right now and somebody came in and started yelling at us, you know, we would have to pause this so it would never make the podcast. But we would be annoyed. We'd be like, why are you doing this? This is our home. So we, we are very respectful when we do try to interact and talk with the, the ghosts. Um, we have to get over the idea that we're talking to nothing, possibly. But we're very genuine. We will introduce ourselves. We'll say we have come from many miles just to, to hear your story, if there's something you'd like to say. Um, and we will do that for hours and hours. And then comes the real lunacy. Um, 
we take all that home. So say, for example, we are running uh, three studio microphones and we are in a location for eight hours. That's 24 hours of audio we have to go back and listen to. That's 24 hours if we were running video. 24 hours of watching basically a still image, even though it's video that never moves, and you pray for something to move, and you pray for something to happen. So that's that's the process, you know. And then we will come back, and we never say we we don't have an official Ghost of Ohio your haunted stamp. So no one ever gets that because we don't really know what that means to be very again transparent. And what we will do is come in and say, here's what we got. We can't explain this. And for some people, that's evidence. That's a ghost. That is definitely a ghost. For other people, they're like, no, that's not a ghost. So we don't ever declare it haunted or not haunted. That is up for the individuals to, you know, based on their beliefs, to look at. We just present it as these are things that we cannot explain. I think that's a pretty good way of doing and it. Now I'll take the a breath, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's great. This is great podcast. Uh, no, I mean, it's, it's great to kind of leave it up to interpretation because it's not like you're taking your word saying it has to be this or it has to be that. Right. You're leaving it up for those, which actually makes it more believable. You're not just trying to get a narrative or push a narrative on yeah. those who don't Yeah, and, and it even becomes because, I mean, just around this table here, I think collectively we are looking at over 50 years of looking for ghosts in Ohio alone. The ghosts of Ohio, I picked them from having all different backgrounds, including a librarian. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we all come from different backgrounds with regard to political leanings, religious beliefs, different jobs. And the reason I wanted to do that is I wanted to, when we came back from an investigation, what we do is once a month we review our quote unquote evidence. We basically sit around in my living room with, with snacks, of course, but, but we all present, hey, I got this on my recorder. I don't know what this is. And then comes the best part. We all fight. Because at the end of the day, as the director, I want to find those one or two pieces where we all go, we don't know what that is. Because I think that's powerful when it's like I came at it from the skeptic angle, I came at it from the electrician angle, from the scientist angle, and we can't explain what happened. That is where what we're looking for before we ever show that to the general public. Because we know as the quote-unquote experts that once we say, hey, this could be a ghost, we've just shattered people. We've rocked their world. So we don't do that until we're done fighting and we all agree this is unexplained. Now, there are aspects of what we do where real-time interactions are happening during the investigation, and those are very, those are very cool things. Um, the, um, like at Farnham Manor, the, the smell of the, oh, the perfume, perfume. Yes. by two individuals all of a sudden, and then it was gone. Um, at Waverly, seeing Jim stand up and walk away in the hallway with three of us watching him and then saying, Jim, where did you go? And he stands back up in the middle of the hallway and says, I didn't go anywhere. What are you talking about? <laughs> I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> That's the one story that when people hear it, they're like, what the? Yeah, I, they saw me walk out of a hallway that I was still standing in as far as I knew. Oh, my God. Yeah. A laser grid pattern that turns off and on by on command. And, um, yeah. There's There are multiple times where things actually do happen right there and you can feel it. I mean, you can just feel an electricity in the air. Mm -hmm. yep. What is the doppelganger thing? That's, I mean, that's the way really. That's the, you want okay. me to tell, me, you tell okay. the story. Go ahead. Um, the, it's a funny story because when this event actually happened, I just thought it was weird. And then a few years later, I was giving a presentation and somebody said, what's the weirdest thing that ever happened to you? And I told that story, and as I did, I'm thinking to myself, my goodness, this is, this is disturbing. And it, it, it's a story that now to this day just freaks me out, and I'm really uncomfortable to get brought up, but, I, but it's... <laughs> um, we went down to uh, Waverly Hills in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, which is a, a former uh, TB hospital, and... One of the questions that got brought up at the time when we were there was, we said, well, where are some of the hot spots? Again, going back to where should we focus? And they said, well, if you really want to encounter something, you should go up to the fourth floor. And apparently it's moved, but it was the fourth floor when we were there. And they said, there's, the big thing is that there's a, they said it was a home to 
the creeper. But they also said that people reported seeing a doppelganger there. And basically a doppelganger is a, a spirit that is disguising itself as, you know, in theory, that is disguising itself as someone else. So the idea that, you know, we could all be as a group and we're walking somewhere and all of a sudden we see uh, someone we all know standing in that office. You know, it's not floating, it's just we think it's them. We say hi, sometimes they talk back, they interact, and other times they just don't do anything. And then we find out later that that person wasn't anywhere there, near there. You know, it's, so it's this idea, it's almost like a double. There were reports of that happening on the fourth floor, but then there was the creeper, and this had first sprung to life from a, a ghost reality show that had just been there. And it was this black shadowy figure that would creep around on its hands and knees on the ceiling. And they said if you wanted to see it, um, you had to get a group of people and everyone would go to one end of the hallway except for one person. And he, would go, or he or she would go to the other end of the hallway and stand there. And then eventually the rest of the group would see this creeper come creeping up behind the one person. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll be the bait. You know? So I went down there and um, I had a very stylish doesn't sound stylish, but like a headlamp on that I always had tried to flip down because I would always blind these guys when I would turn it on. So I would always try to tilt it down so it would like illuminate the ground. And I had a, um, a video camera with me. And Mark and two other investigators went to the other end of the hallway. And we were like, okay, we ready? And I put the camera down and then I stood up and I clicked the, uh, the beam off and I stood there for about 20 minutes uh, in the dark until I didn't feel anything, I didn't feel weird or anything like that. And then I heard these guys at the other end of the hallway and they were like, where did he go? Oh, I think he went in that room over there. And then somebody went, Jim? And I said, yeah. And they said, oh my. <laughs> um, <laughs> that wasn't him. <laughs> And so I'll let Mark fill in what he, the group, claimed that they saw. It, it seemed to us that someone that looked like Jim stood up and walked away into a side room. Leaving an empty hallway that I was still standing in. So they couldn't see you at all? It was <laughs> dim. It was, like... it was dim. We could see, I mean, you could see the shape. And you could see, I mean, you could see enough. I mean, there was enough. It wasn't black up there in the hallway, but it. But it I was, mean, when he was he like 30 feet, left. 30 feet away from us down there. I mean, we oh. could see, he was the only one there in the hallway, we saw. But when he walked away, you saw nothing in the hallway. Mm. No, no, no. Yeah. Nothing in the hallway. Okay. hallway. Okay. It was an so empty he was hallway. just completely gone. He just stood up walk, and, and just kind of stoically walked <laughs> like, oh, I'm tired and bored. I'm going to walk over here and investigate this other area. So for the record, I sleep at night now because I've determined that whatever was happening was happening to them. <laughs> Nothing happened to me. I was up there the whole time and stuff. But to me, what was interesting is immediately I was like, well, what? that's really weird. Why weren't you guys freaking out or something? And then I think you told me, Mark, that, like you said, they thought that I had just gotten bored and wandered off and that when you guys were saying, I think you went in that hallway and they called my name, they were all looking into that room thinking I was going to call back right. and that when you look back, if I have it correct, I was back in the hallway. Yeah. Wow. So, I, yeah. so is there something that causes a particular person to have a doppelganger? Well, what's weird also about this incident, because he never moved, but what we <laughs> saw was him get up and walk away, but then you have to imagine, he's still standing there, but we can't see him. Yeah, I don't. And see, those are the sort of things that we're like, we can't say that was a ghost, because what, what is that? But it, yeah. it's a, Yeah, it was odd. Yeah, it was <laughs> yeah. very odd. Was that the oddest thing that's ever happened to you guys? I'm sure Wendy and Sam have one. No. What about everyone? So each yeah. of you, what is the weirdest thing that's ever yeah, happened or oddest thing know. on um, one of these hunts? The weirdest thing for me was I saw a doppelganger at... Um, Mansfield Reformatory and it was the the person who was like kind of our chaperone for the evening and 
I was up on the West Wing. I was up on the second tier with one other person. And as we came around the corner, I saw him, this um, chaperone, shall we say, we'll call him Bob, walk this way behind me, or under us, and he walked under the walkway and headed towards solitary confinement. And I said, who's in our section? Oh, it's just Bob. And he never waved his hand or anything to say, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, whatever. Well, come to find out, I questioned Jim about it a couple days later and he called Bob. Bob's like, yeah, I was not walking around at all. And asked me to describe what I saw. Well, what I saw was him, but looking back at it, he looked like he was wearing a policeman's uniform or maybe a, a guard's uniform because it was short sleeved and like a button down and then pants and it all just kind of looked tan. He was completely bald. So that's why I was like, oh, it's Bob. He was the only person there that, you know, fit that description. When Bob is the chaperone there for the night, he always wears a long sleeved sweatshirt, black sweatshirt, Mansfield Reformatory and blue jeans. So whatever it was I saw that I thought was him, wasn't him, but was making itself kind of look like him. Mm -hmm. And then he admitted that other people had seen him when it wasn't him, including a girlfriend who saw him at home while he was at work. So wow. that was probably the weirdest thing. That was pretty creepy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when we go into Mansfield, we, we kind of rent it out for just us. So yeah. there were only like, I think, 18 or 19 yeah. of us there that night in the entire reformatory. Wow. So it's, 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 it's the whole idea that it was just somebody who happened to look like him happened by or something. It was lo We were locked in. And what was weird is where I saw him coming from was a wall. And I don't know why that didn't occur to me at the time. <laughs> it wasn't like he walked out of a room. He, he walked out of a wall. Like, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. That, is, that is interesting. We do that a lot. Where we, I, I don't know if it's being jaded or we've just been doing this for so long that a lot of things we step back and we're like, that was really weird. Why didn't we talk about that more? You know, it's just kind of like, you saw him come out of the wall. Yeah, okay, whatever. It's, Anybody else have experience? Uh, well, well, um, I was with Jim, and he's published this in a book, so I can talk about it. Um, we were, oh, Wendy's adjusting the microphone. Hello. Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> 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 um, this is Sam speaking. Um, I was with Jim at the Haunted Hydro, and oh, yeah. that, uh, the, if you haven't been to the Haunted Hydro, it, it, during the Halloween season, it is one of those, you know, Halloween spook you haunted houses where people jump out from the shadows and in scary costumes. Um, and we were investigating it because it is haunted without the, the makeup. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it was just me and Jim and one other member. And, and uh, I was at one end of the haunted hydro in what would be considered their little garage. They had a, a they had a hearse. They had acquired a hearse and it was parked in the garage. And um, Jim was all the way at the other end. And picture, you know, a haunted house in limbo where, you know, it's still being built for the next season and rearranged. So we really had to reach each other. We really did have to go through a maze to get to each other. So In the dark. In the dark. <laughs> yeah. So I was standing in the garage um, by the by the outside wall because um, I, we had been told that um, a person who used to work there, we're gonna go with the name Bob, because he's so <laughs> creative. Um, it's not very spooky it's, though. It's a, it's a good word. Um, uh, we were told that Bob, who used to do makeup there, um, he passed away, but he, he used to do makeup in Hollywood and um, things like that, and he, um, loved doing the makeup for the people at this haunted house. And his makeup desk, um, stand, dresser, whatever, used to be along that outside wall. So I decided, eh, okay. I leaned against the hearse and I was just doing an EVP session where you ask questions and hope to get a, a response on, on a voice recorder. And 
I had asked, I, I had been talking about, um, I, I actually, I'm the librarian in the room that everybody was cheering for before. Um, uh, I also have a degree in theater. So I was talking to Bob as though, hey, you know, we think alike. You know, I wanted to go into special effects a long time ago and things like that. And I, I had said something to the effect of, um, you know, everybody here has really good stories to tell about you um, that, you know, you did such a great job here and everybody had a lot of respect for you. And behind me, probably 20 feet behind me, there was this loud, BAM! Like somebody took their fist and just wailed on one of those fake walls. Wow. And I, I stopped and froze. <laughs> and, you know, it, my first instinct wasn't, oh my God, a ghost. Um, my first instinct was, oh God, what do I have to avoid? Because I thought something was going to come flying out of I heard it on the other side of the building, and I thought <laughs> yeah. she had broken one of their I, very expensive <laughs> Ghost of Ohio not in short for props. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I know. Thanks for the vote of confidence. <laughs> <laughs> I touched nothing. Um, and I hear from where? across the haunted hydro what was that <laughs> and, and I'm like that was not me that was that happened behind me I don't know what it was and he's like I'm on my way and of course it took a while because he had to go through the maze. <laughs> so, getting scared every time I came around the corner there was like a mannequin there that they didn't tell me about yeah so he, he finally made it over and we tried to figure out what that sound was, and we found, well, he had, from my perspective of when it happened, I had the perception that it was, it sounded like a screwdriver hit the floor and rolled. And I'm like, it sounded like a screwdriver that hit the floor and rolled, and you were looking everywhere for a screwdriver, and we did mm -hmm. not see one, and, um, but you did pick up an angle iron off the floor, which an angle iron, if you don't know, um, is I didn't a know what it was. <laughs> piece of metal that you can screw into two pieces of wood to kind of hold them together. Um, and it's used a lot in theater. Um, and you picked that up and you dropped that and said, was that the sound? And I'm like, no, it wasn't. Well, turns out I, I went and listened to my audio later and that was indeed the sound. And Actually, I even have an EVP on my audio when I played it back that, let me see, how did it go? Um, it was, you had asked, um, was this it? And I said, no, I don't think, it, that, that wasn't it. And there was like a voice whispering in the back, yes. So I'm like, oh, that's so oh, that's, cool. That's cool, <laughs> you know, in hindsight, you know? So it's like, okay, that, that was something, so. And we found out later that Bob, sorry, I had to think about it. <laughs> Bob. We found out later that Bob, when he, that he loved the haunted house thing and that after he, would, when he was alive, after he was done doing the makeup, he would still hang around later. And when people were going through the haunted house, he would bang on the wall. Just to try oh. to scare the people going through there, oh, cool. and that now this is going to t sound totally made up, but it's not. Um, he would do that so often that, and this is his real name, or what he goes by. The owner of the haunted hydro is named Crazy Bob. Fake name Bob. The, the the makeup guy would bang on the walls just to try to scare the people. Crazy Bob told him he had to stop because he was banging so hard on the walls that he would occasionally knock the angle irons out. Oh, now, we did not know any of that until <laughs> afterwards. Now, you yeah. could say that Crazy Bob embellished that to make it a scarier story, but it, again, it fit. If he wasn't making that up, that historical narrative fits what we encountered. Makes sense. <laughs> That's creepy. <laughs> That's pretty cool. And again, we leave it up to people because we're like, we don't, we can't explain that. And if you guys, anybody wants to try to explain it, that's cool. We just are like, I don't, I don't know how you explain that. It could be just through a lot of really big coincidences, but I, I don't know. It was loud, and the, I mean, the, it's called the haunted hydro because it was an old uh, water hydraulic plant oh, wow. that flooded in 1913, and this thing is just a giant 
one, two, three stories maybe? It's a multi-story, but it's just an open hunk of concrete. Mm -hmm. So it echoed through there because they just put all the plywood down for their maze, but I really did think she was hurt. <laughs> no, I, I really thought something was fine. Like, yeah. 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 We were the only two in the building. The third, the, the third person was actually outside mm -hmm. at the time. So. so, how do you guys usually present these findings, or what do you have afterwards? I mean, do I mean you know, for us, you're going to be doing a program. Um, Carly, what's the date on that? Uh, November the third, I believe, at one. Yes, uh -huh. November third, and that'll be here, here at the Eaton Branch. Yep. yep. Uh, but another place, like, how do you normally do that? Um, um, usually what we would do is if it's a, regardless of whether it's like a public um, investigation or if it's something like in a private house, we will go back, we'll look at all the evidence, like I said, we'll get together and fight and go over it all, and then we will set up a time where we can go back out and sit down with the owners and present it. So it's basically a laptop, and we'll go through and we're like, here's this audio, we'll explain where we were during the night and then play the audio, show the pictures, the video, what have you, and then we give them a copy, and that's it. We don't ever, we very rarely um, will put it out on our website or Facebook or anything like that because that's, it's a private place, you know, it's a private residence, and so that's up to them what they want to do with it. Um, for the more public ones, or you know, we would still, if we were not gonna go do a presentation, we will still, prior to the presentation, get together and be like, here's what we found, here's the sort of things we'd like to talk about. But not so much that we would make any outrageous claims about things, but we just want to be very cautious just to make sure, because again, this is a library, this is a public building. There is, unfortunately now, a sort of stigma that's come as to what not only looking for ghosts are, but what ghosts are because they make for really spooky television shows. But that's not reality. But we understand and take it very seriously that sometimes if a building becomes known as being haunted, people are gonna think there's all sorts of weird and spooky things, like this is now the Amityville Horror House. So it's not, and if anything, I, we would hope that by talking about it, we bring more people in here, simply because you have got real history coming together with folklore and nothing's going to get them. It's nice. It's something that you can just visit. So that's something that we would do in a public sort of presentation, you know, to kind of raise that awareness that if you're into ghosts and you want to possibly experience it, you have to do this, re you know, you can't go and be a, a certified ghost hunter. I don't think maybe you can officially, but the easiest way if you want to look for ghosts, you get a library card. I mean, it's the That's truth. That's a wonderful plug. Yeah. <laughs> but it's the truth. It's, you know, I mean, because I think what has happened with a lot of these ghost shows and just the way that, now I sound like a paranormal pappy, society today, um, <laughs> but we want instantaneous answers. And it doesn't matter if it's ghosts or not. We just want an instantaneous answer to say, well, if you want to find a ghost, you have to sit quietly in the place, and you have to do this really, really weird sort of ritual that's called research. People don't want to do that, but yet there are people that really do want to look for ghosts. And in this case, this is a perfect place to go because you have history. You guys have the genealogy stuff. You can go back, and these people were real people. And I think it's just a wonderful thing because even if we don't find any evidence of there being a ghost here, you can't deny that the ghost story is helping keep the history of this building alive. And that's a beautiful thing, it really is. And if people wanna experience a real, possibly haunted house, come hang out at the library. <laughs> people don't know this, but it's really weird. And I'm not just saying this because I'm sitting in a room full of librarians and next to one. <laughs> but you get to take all this stuff home for free. I don't know if a lot of people know that. You get to come in here, you get books and movies and stuff, and you take them home for free. Yeah, so and then when you're done with them, you bring them back and you get more. Yeah. Well, we got a great paranormal for section. Free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be perusing that this evening. Yep, 133s. <laughs> but in all seriousness, it's a, it's, a great, it's a great opportunity for people to actually find out what is real ghost hunting, what does it entail, and we use a lot of resources too, uh, genealogy records. Yep. Uh, Newspapers.com is a favorite of mine that I love to go back and find. I've been doing it here tonight, finding new articles that you didn't even have. 
about the murder. Nice. Um, <laughs> and it's just like pulling it out of a little window out of time and just saying, wow, this is like you're reading it for the first time and it ha was written 100 years ago. Um, yeah. Just fun. Well, we're so excited you guys are here. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So is there anything uh, to wrap it up? Is there anything you want to plug, any kind of social media stuff you want to give out or stuff upcoming? Um, the Ghosts of Ohio is all on Facebook and Twitter and all those things I really don't understand, but you can That's find fair. us at ghostsofohio.org. Um, strangeandspookyworld.com is mm -hmm. me through my author site. And, uh, yeah, and then we're getting ready to, and you guys are part of the, the fall tour, but beginning, I think it's late September and going through the end of November, we are out on the road traveling all around Ohio to share stories like this and stuff so people can go to our websites and find where we're going to be and come out and hear even more spooky stories. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. Well, uh, if you want to go around the room once again, to, or clockwise here, just say your name and say bye or whatever. You want final words, final parting words? <laughs> um, and then, uh, yeah, well, hopefully not. I mean, this is a ghost story. No. <laughs> uh, but anyway, if there's anything you want to, and that will. All right. Well, I'm, I, I just really enjoy doing what we do here, and we have a great group of uh, friends that do this crazy thing. We drive for hours and hours and, and just dive into this history and dive into the exploration of trying to find make a connection with something we, we can't explain, we don't understand, but we know there's something there because we time and time again find these connections or experiences yeah. these, these things that are just like, wow. And it just keeps the adrenaline going and, and it's fun. I, and, and I'm Mark, um, so that's my final parting thought on that. <laughs> I'm Wendy again. Um, I guess the only thing I want to say is I want to remind all of the people out there who do want a ghost hunt or are starting a ghost hunt that you really need to be respectful of the area that you're in, the building that you're in, the people that are around you. You don't, we have a bad enough of a reputation being ghost hunters, just watching some of the stuff you see on TV and we don't need to contribute to it. So. You know, just remember that there are people who work and live in the places mm -hmm. that you're investigating and, you know, that's their home and that's their territory and you need to be a little respectful of it. And, and that's going to make you a good ghost hunter. So. And I'm James Willis. I'm the, the leader of this merry band of ghost hunters. So um, I don't know if I have anything else to add. Support your local libraries. Yes. And, um, <laughs> and I mean, I guess I will say that I know sort of what Wendy was saying, that there is a stigma that uh, is attached to not only the ghost hunting community, but also people who even dare to believe in ghosts, or UFOs, or monsters, or just weird things, and so I would just like to tell all of you people out there, stay weird, don't, I, I've been normal for a very short period of my life, and it's very boring, so despite what people want to tell you, it's cool to be weird, I've made a career out of being weird, so no matter what happens, stay weird, and go check out a library. Hey, and uh, this is Sam. Um, I can't possibly improve on any of the words that Mark and Wendy and Jim just said, so I'm not going to support your local library. And I, you know, I can't express enough, you know, do your research and, and have respect, like Wendy said. So, yeah. And I'm Carly Wall. I'm the branch librarian at Eaton. And I want to encourage everybody to come check out James Willis's books. And we've got our program coming up November 3rd at 1 p.m. So be sure to stop in and see. This is Lauren Robinson again. And I want to encourage everyone to come out to our Preble County room where you can actually read some of the books that we have about the Eaton Public Library's history as well as different branches and different buildings in Preble County. And I'm Logan Wagman, once again, the po podcast co-host that's no longer co-hostless. And this is no longer co-host. Single host. <laughs> Single host. Um, and, uh, of course, always check us out at preborlibrary.org or give us a call, 456-4331, the Eaton Branch here. Uh, yeah, thank you guys for coming out. And Thank you. And yeah, it, it was actually, I do have to say, I wanted to thank the library for actually having us out here, not only for doing the podcast, but for also... Um, having the confidence and realizing that we weren't that weird and yeah. allowing us into your library to do the investigation because as much as you guys are excited 
we are excited to actually come into a place and be, to just to be invited into a place is actually an honor and a privilege. So I, I want to thank you guys. You have no idea how yeah. excited we've been. <laughs> no idea. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure most of our uh, communities can be pretty excited about your findings or even just the presentation. Just yeah, a chance, come out and see chance to talk yeah. to you and, Remember. of course, listen to this podcast, please. And, uh, <laughs> well, for that, uh, we'll call it a good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye.